no, you're emotionally, mentally and physically exhausted. Hello my fellow mythical creatures, I hope you are well. So today's little mini video is uh, answering the most famous question that most university students ever come across is what the f*** is Lacan on about? Lacan, as you may already know, is the greatest psychoanalyst and the biggest intellectual celebrity of France during the 20th century. This research made my head hurt and I'm aware that this video may make your head hurt, which is why I'm going to do my best to ensure that is not the case. So where do we begin? Well, Lacan wrote about psychoanalytical theory as though it were poetry, and for that reason he's one of the most trickiest theorists to read out of the writings of. Trust me, I'm not the only one who thinks this. He discussed difficult, challenging, polemical, and often at times chaotic theories using the most obscure syntaxes and surreal allusions. It's like he really didn't want to give the reader any chance of understanding what the hell he was going on about. Top guy, top guy. You may have known Lacan for his most famous work, The Mirror Stage as Formative of the Function of I, which extrapolated on the experience of a baby seeing their reflection for the first time and recognising themselves in a mirror. Something he argues is unique to the human psychological experience. The mirror phrase, he argues, is the uncomfortable experience when we realise that we don't look how we feel. Inside, we as humans are but formless streams of consciousness, made up of speeding thoughts, desires and images, chaotic and ambivalent to the core. But what we see in our reflection is on the outside, we look stable. We are composed entities and only the words we employ can transcend this aching void. Not knowing what to say is a completely human experience. An existential truth as it were, not a personal failing. The only one dimensional thing about humanity is the mirror image. And language is the only mechanism humans can employ which comes close enough to understanding what really goes on inside of us. You're probably wondering how a psychoanalyticist got caught up with linguistics and language. Lacan really enjoyed Freud's discovery of a structure of unconsciousness and wished to build upon this theory by proclaiming the structure of the unconsciousness is that of discourse. The aim of Lacan was to demystify the fantasy of the omniscience of the objective, the impersonal, the external opposition often associated with science and theory. For him, the unconsciousness was a form of rhetorical energy which expressed or suppressed desires and was structured entirely in the same way language is. Effectively, Lacan was more of a literary critic than a psychoanalyticist when it came to reading the body's expression of the unconsciousness. Which is why we're going into linguistic theory right now. Before we get into that, however, we need to recap on one of the theorists who inspired his approach. Saussure. Lacan was undeniably and openly influenced by Saussure's model of the linguistic sign, which is two parts, the signifier and the signified. If you're unfamiliar with this, here's a little diagram. As you can see, we have the word tree. That is the signifier. Beneath it, we have a tree itself. That is the signified. And the circle around it equals the combination of the two, known by Saussure as the sign. But Lacan refers to it differently. Lacan doesn't refer to a sign, he calls it a signifying chain, which we will get onto later. The signifying chain is not the only twist Lacan gave to Saussure's model. Lacan took issue with this particular Saussure image because he claimed that the signifier and the signified didn't actually correlate to a representative of nature. He argued that it was still a sign of culture. Saussure's model of the sign had three points of contention that Lacan challenged. One, that the sign is a representation of a thing. Two, signs function individually. And three, the line that separates the signifier, i.e. the word, from the signified, i.e. the concept, is only an abstract function. And if you're wondering right now what a sign means, well I can tell you that in semiotics it is anything that communicates meaning that is not the sign itself to the interpreter of the sign. Just take that message now. In other words, the sign has meaning only in the eyes of the beholder. Lacan proposes his countermodel to the sign which features two doors and the signifiers above them which were ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, the signifiers have nothing to do with the signified, which is kind of his point about when he picked apart Saussure's thing. They are doors, not ladies and gentlemen in any way. 
The signifiers only have meaning in a cultural context. The signs are cultural, and the signifiers bear no accuracy on their signification. This sign is something the reader has to fit their body into, which is even more relevant in today's century when it comes to discussions of non-binary, gender-fluid and transgender people. These signs state a law of sexual difference, which are socially constructed and not explanatory in any way of what they are signifying. They also now create a difference between two doors that isn't there naturally and was never there before. Therefore, to Lacan, the bar dividing them is one of repression. The signified is repressed by the signifier, and this is indistinguishable from its societal function. Signs, therefore, systematically and unconsciously constitute societal conventions. We, as a society, are acculturated by signs. Language, he argues, operates on us as much as we operate on it, and signs play their part in the unconsciousness. So rather than Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am, Lacan's self-identity is more an enigmatic self-estrangement. You know, I think where I am not, therefore I am where I do not think. I know. To explain Lacan's self-estrangement, we have to turn to Roman Jacobson's linguistic study of the metaphor and the metonym, and Freud's distinction between condensation and displacement of the unconsciousness. For those unfamiliar with Freud, condensation is the method by which the repressed returns in hidden ways, and displacement is the unconsciousness's defence mechanism, where the mindset substitutes a new aim or object for goals felt in the original form to be dangerous. Does that make sense? Let's continue. Whilst Lacan considered himself Freudian in his approach, he actually differs from Freud, primarily due to the discussion of poetics and discourse. For where Freud constructs discourse about psychoanalysis around archaeology, Lacan replaces archaeology with linguistics. But inspired by the archaeologist, Lacan applies the method of structural linguistics to non-linguistic and cultural data, so myth and relations, and thus creates structural anthropology. Now this is the final bit, and this is where my head hurts, so hopefully we can get through this together. Okay? What the f*** is Lacan's linguistic structure of the unconsciousness? Well, Hayden v. White is our critic of the day. As the leading topological theorist, he broke down Lacanian theory into three phases and four tropes to show how Lacanian discourse moves back and forth between the known and the unknown. Phase 1. Metaphor performs the naming operation. Mimesis describes any data mark for analysis. Basically, in phase 1, when you as the creative have to think of something new, you are already in the rhetorical phrase of mimesis, and you have already gotten there because you've applied and used a metaphor. Phase 2. Metonymy is used to divide and classify parts. Diegesis involves the argument running aside the descriptive materials. Don't panic, we're about to explain that. In other words, when you as the creative thinker begin to unfold the micro-units of metaphorical object that you employed in your mimesis, you are now playing a part in metonymy. And just in case you need a little reminder, a metonym is a figure of speech which consists of the use of one object for another to which it is related. It is in phase two where you employ Saussure's signifier over the signified model, i.e. where signs start to take place, in Lacan's structure, the sign becomes what he calls the signifying chain, which is interlocking system of signifiers. The best way to imagine a signifying chain is imagining you have a chain necklace connecting to another chain of another chain necklace. So you have to think that. Yes. Lacan also changes the model from the original Caesarian model because he places more significance and dominance on the signifier, which many critics have argued is his misunderstanding of the original model. Diegesis, in phase two, then allows the creator to expand on the idea of the sign. For those unfamiliar with the term diegesis, it is Greek for narrative or plot. The signification has nothing to do with presumed reality, but operates solely on the human construct and systems of signification. Are we having fun? Good, because here comes the final phase. The synecdote integrates the parts of the whole, which is founded upon the original metaphor. Diataxis then takes place, which involves a combination of the previous two methods. 
In other words, the little units from diegesis then become larger, i.e. diataxis. The subjects start to make their meaning had, and the meaning of everything is subsequently subsumed into the synecdote. Now wasn't that fun? That is just briefly explaining <laughs> this concept right now. My head hurts, I'm sure your head hurts, I'm sorry that that probably wasn't as easy as I hoped, I hope I edited this well. If you have any questions on anything I said, the full text will be on my website and I'm gonna lie down and go sleepy bites because I am so tired. If you have any requests for anything else that you'd like me to cover into mini versions, please mention it down below. And until next time, remember books save lives, so keep reading. Pip pip. Hello my fellow myth- Therefore we realise all we can do is impl- <sighs> I'm so tired. This is defense mechanism where the mindset cheat. Oh god.